Hello, everyone. Welcome to the PhD in Educational Neuroscience Distinguished Lecture hosted by Gallaudet University. Welcome to those here in the auditorium and to those joining us through live streaming from across the country. This lecture series aims to honor world-renowned scientists in the fields of psychology, education, cognitive sciences, and neuroscience. These different fields and all of the interdisciplinary fields in between contribute to the new and growing field of educational neuroscience. They increase our understanding of the human mind and the neural mechanisms of learning. This year's Distinguished Lecture Series theme is The Origin and Nature of Language, Numeracy and Thought. With our Distinguished Lectures in the heart of DC, we want to build bridges across fields and scientific communities in the area and across the nation. Everyone is welcome to attend, and we hope you enjoy these exceptional presentations. Dr. Benesic is the second of our spring lecturers. We are delighted and honored to have Dr. Benesic accept our invitation. She comes to us from Rutgers University. She received her PhDs in both experimental cognitive psychology and clinical psychology, as well as a BSN in nursing. In addition to being the Elizabeth Solomon Professor for Developmental Cognitive Neuroscience, she is currently the director of the Infant Studies Laboratory at the Center for Molecular and Behavioral Neuroscience and the Carter Center for Neurocognitive Research, part of a conglomerate of centers that research neurological disorders. She has also worked as a principal investigator in the Temporal Dynamics of Learning Center, a National Science Foundation Science of Learning Center and she received grants from the National Institute of Health to support her research. Her current research focuses on the study of early neural processes for normal cognitive and language development, as well as the impact of disordered processing on infant neurocognitive status in high risk or neurologically impaired infants. Today, we will learn more about Dr. Benesic's work in acoustic mapping in infants and how this impacts early language learning. The title of the talk is, as you can see here, please join me in welcoming Dr. Benesic. Thank you. Um, I'm honored to be here and to be invited to this um, exciting um, university and center. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Lorianne Petito and Ilaria Bertoletti, I've said it wrong, Bert Bertoletti, um, for inviting me. Um, and um, uh, here we go. I'm just looking for my cursor, which I know is here somewhere. Oh, there we go. Makes it more exciting. So this is, um, a little snapshot of some of the things I do in my lab. Um, I'm not going to talk about most of them today, um, I'm but I am going to tell you about a subset of the research going, in my, going on in my lab that involve uh, behavioral intervention that seems quite effective at improving acoustic mapping and subsequent language. But we also do um, uh, naturally sleeping, uh, dense array EEG, looking at um, Wait a minute, let me put my um, timer on. Um, looking at the microstructure of sleep, including um, uh, spindles and uh, slow waves, and how those might contribute to myelination of the developing brain. Um, we do naturally sleeping MRI and fMRI, um, as well as dense array EEG, which I'm going to talk about today, behavioral testing. So we're doing lots of different things. These are the old we now have new hydrocell nets. So just to know that we've moved into the new century. 
Um, so what I'm going to try to do first, particularly for those who haven't had a chance to, view, to um, read the review paper that I sent, is I'm going to give you a very brief overview of studies which demonstrate that difficulties in discriminating rapidly successful sensory events early in infancy are predictive of later outcome. Um, so why look at baby brain function? They're cute, but annoying. <laughs> because while following this magical unfolding of early abilities across development, we can begin to answer some very big questions, including how do early events of development influence later cognitive and linguistic competence? How might very early abnormalities in the functional organization of brain networks be causal in developmental disorders such as language learning impairment, autism, and ADHD? And how early might such biomarkers be detected, measured, and perhaps remediated um, with non-invasive technologies? Um, so you probably know that as newborns, um, babies can discriminate the sounds of every language in the world. Um, but hearing babies do this acoustically, not linguistically. So starting at birth, the baby's developing brain is constructing an acoustic map of the sounds of his or her native language. And I assume that deaf babies that are exposed to sign are doing the same thing with, um, with visual language. Um, this gradual process is called perceptual narrowing. And it's thought to be completed by the end of the first year. Of course, that was before we got involved, but that's the general view. Um, and mapping of these acoustic contrasts salient to the surrounding language ultimately allows the child to respond in a fast, fast automatic way to the incoming language stream, which is really important to setting up native language. Um, so basic acoustic processing, this efficient processing of these basic auditory events, which are in the tens of millisecond domain. A millisecond is a thousandth of a second, um, and which we call rapid auditory processing, or RAP, is critical to mounting language in normative development. And it allows the most optimal acoustic maps to be constructed. And this is because many speech sounds, phonemes like da or ta, only differ by very brief spectral and or temporal changes specifically within the tens of milliseconds. So for example, this is speech formants for ba versus da. This is frequency by time. And what you can see is this little area here that's 30 to 40 milliseconds long is the only place where you can detect the difference between these two um, signals, because you have the steady state vowel, and then you have these differences in the consonants. So differences in these basic acoustic abilities um, have been shown to be related to both concurrent and later language learning difficulties in my lab as well as in others. Research from my lab strongly suggests that the ability to perform these very fine acoustic discriminations within speech or non-speech, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later, in early infancy is critically important to normative language development and that this may go awry in a subset of developmental disorders. Uh, moreover, these skills predict language outcomes through early pre-reading and seem to have an impact on later language. And we talked a little bit about this today, how there's a knock-on effect of having a um, less deep um, information um, uh, set to allow the child to interact with the world. Um, and we talked a little bit today also about the possibility that this could be a supramodal problem. That is because there are uh, a, a few very early papers that suggest that kids with these sorts of disorders have difficulties not just in the auditory domain, but also in the visual domain with something like flicker fusion. So when a light is flashing, what's the point at which you see it become steady state? Um, and with uh, two-point discrimination, um, uh, in the somatosensory domain. So is there one point touching me or two points touching me? If it's done at the same time, individuals with dyslexia and various types of language disorders have a lot of difficulty doing this. 
So that's really something that would be interesting to explore with this group as a whole. Um, because if it's supermodal across all systems, uh, or if one system leads, for instance, so maybe the primary problem could be in the visual system, that doesn't cause a problem because if you have problems with structure for motion when you see something begin to move, or with flicker fusion, you're not walking into doorways. It doesn't affect you very much. But if you can't lay down this acoustic mapping for, for um, um, language, then you have a lot of difficulty. Um, in many of our studies, we examine populations at higher risk for various disorders as a consequence of a child being born into a family uh, with such disorders. Um, so all of the babies that I'm going to talk about are at risk. So this is not a clinical population, and it's important to remember that because when you see some of our results, you'll see we have very strong results in a, in a situation where some subset of those children are going to um, develop just normally without other kinds of problems. So heritability studies suggest that the risk can be 30 to 60 percent higher depending on which population you're talking about. If you're talking about uh, ASD, uh, for instance, there's a 60 percent higher degree of risk. So it varies and according to study. So I'm not going to tell you about all of these, but we have a lot of studies that show that infants at high familial risk for developing language learning impairments, have cons we have consistently identified a subset of children whose ability to detect these subtle changes that I'm talking about here um, are compromised. And such processing deficits predict to the impaired processing seen in these disorders. So it appears to be um, causal. For example, in a 2002 study, we were able, using just behavioral measures of rapid auditory processing, including operantly conditioned head turn and habituation recognition memory, to identify with about 90% accuracy infants at six months that would be a standard deviation below the mean at age three years. And this was true irrespective of family history. So if the babies were very poor processors, it didn't matter whether they had a family history or not. That predicted to much poorer outcome. Um, in a 2011 study, um, we examined, I think I'll just wait to show that, infants with and without a family history of language learning impairment prospectively and longitudinally at 6, 9, 12, 16, 24, 36, and 48 months. Um, ERPs, evoked response potentials, to non-speech simulate at six months, specifically the N2 star, which is the uh, peak on the deviant wave in the EEG just before the baby um, makes a discrimination response. So it's that preceding um, peak. And to the parents, we call the next um, complex the aha wave. So the baby's like, aha, that's different. So just before they do that, there's a peak that appears to be very important. And in all of our studies, in five of our studies, has been the very best predictor of a later outcome. So we're very focused on what that might mean. Um, what else did I not say? But interestingly enough, this prediction was only in this rapid speech-like 70 millisecond interstimulus interval um, condition. So we gave them 300 milliseconds, which is a longer pause in between, but with only 70 milliseconds between tone signals in this case, um, babies had a lot of difficulty um, parsing those sounds that were very rapid and successive. Um, and in the same study, we saw significant hemispheric differences um, at 6, 9, and 12 months. Specifically, we saw suppressed activation on the left as compared to the right, although you see it's resolving a little bit as the children get a little bit older. And this suggests that babies with a family history of language learning impairment, not babies with language learning impairment, because these babies are too young to be having those kinds of problems. They're not really talking very much at this point. Um, uh, that they, they show atypical lateralization and differences in brain areas recruited 
when processing these fast, transient, um, non-speech auditory signals. So these infants may have different, less efficient, and possibly slower maturational trajectories for these types of perceptual stimuli. Although in this study, when we looked from 6 to 48 months, it wasn't just a lag. Some of the components came online um, by 12 months, and others didn't. So there's certainly something more going on than just a maturational lag, and that's something that we continue to investigate. So overall, our research over the last uh, 20 years, in conjunction with converging findings from other labs, highlight the import importance of efficient processing of these basic auditory events to setting up language. Um, and I gave a few of you this research paper that sort of gives an overview of, you know, 15 years of research. So if anyone's interested in having it that doesn't have it, they can let me or um, Laura Ann know and we will send it to them. So how do you measure brain responses in infants? They're cute, right? Number of different ways. We can use uh, electroencephalography, EEG, and event-related potentials. Um, EEG activity reflects the summation of the synchronous activity of millions of neurons that have similar spatial orientation. And brain event-related potentials are derived from EEG that are averaged across single trials to create an average waveform that is time-locked to external stimulation, supposedly allowing you to pull the signal out of the noise. Except now we're studying the noise, because it turns out the noise is really interesting. But just keep in mind that there are other ways to look at these types of signals. You can also use uh, magnoencephalography. You can use near-infrared spectroscopy, which, which measures um, a hemodynamic response. We're not going to talk about that today, but those are all ways to look at infants. You can also look at neural dynamics within EEG, the noise, basically, oscillations. Um, uh, cross-frequency uh, phase coupling. I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. It's an area that we're really focusing on. And you can do brain mapping using MRI and fMRI acquired during natural sleep. And we've been one of the first people to do that. We had the first resting state paper. We had the first um, uh, uh, scan of babies uh, using, um, anyway, let me go on. I won't get into that. Um, you can also use something called a fast Fourier transform and look at the time frequency analysis of EEG. Um, and so you're looking at brain oscillatory responses. Um, you can also use something called a wavelet analysis, which is very similar. Um, and synchronize neural oscillations in the low frequencies, these delta, theta, and alpha frequencies, um, are thought to provide key mechanisms that orchestrate network coordination during development. And they may be involved in, brain, in um, information transfer across brain areas. Um, theta oscillations, in particular, we're very interested in um, because they're important for perceptual and cognitive functions, such as declarative and episodic memory, and have been proposed as a neural mechanism that subserves phonemic discrimination. Um, gamma oscillations, and you'll see we also are very interested in gamma, may represent synchronized activity of local neuronal populations during sensory and cognitive processes, but they may also play a role in coupling of remote cortical areas, and this is more likely to be the case in higher levels of gamma, so from 70 hertz up to 90, which we don't really show here, which we've been looking at, and we can see that there are shifts in the area of gamma that is present and also coupling with theta and beta um, frequencies uh, across time. So research suggests that brain oscillations, these cyclic fluctuations of the membrane potential, um, control neuronal excitability, integrate sensory output, um, and may coordinate higher level functions such as language, memory, and learning. Um, our previous studies in pilot data uh, strongly suggest that oscillatory dynamics and their hierarchical organization have a developmental timeline, um, and they may capture disruption in normative development. 
with or without differences in EEG. Um, so this is a, an area that's just emerging. There's only just a few labs looking at this in infants. Um, most of the work is animal work. Um, and actually, this is a good time to say that I have a new book coming out, uh, an edited book with Erz Ribery, that um, is called Emergent Brain Dynamics, Pre-Birth to Adolescence. And it's um, a series of reports and papers um, that came out of a, a symposium, actually a brainstorming session that, I, that we had in March at the Max Planck Institute with the Strongman Forum. And we had 40 experts from all over the world figure out what do we know, how do we know it, what don't we know, and what do we still need to find out. So this is still a very new area uh, in development. And uh, it's not only the infant period that's of a lot of interest, um, the area of adolescence is also extremely interesting because there are lots of things going on at that point in time that are not well understood that are probably just not reorganization and pruning. So um, I think it's going to be out for the FENS meeting in July. So look for it. Uh, as I said to Laura Ann, I'm sure it's going to go right up to the top of the, the New York Times bestseller list. Everybody's going to want a copy. <laughs> Maybe not. OK, so one of the very first papers um, that we did on oscillations um, was focused on gamma frequency band. And that's because it's been linked in humans and animals uh, to a wide variety of higher cognitive processes, including attention, perception, memory, and language. Um, and we first examined power density um, not oscillations, power density in frontal cortex across the language burst um, in two groups of children to determine whether these high frequency oscillations could be related to the development of cognitive abilities. We looked at the power spectra in these two groups with and without a family history of language learning impairment. So we looked at 16, 24, and 36 months across the language burst because we wanted to make sure we saw something. So we wanted a time when there were lots of things happening in the brain. And this paper is published, and you can have it if you want to. But I just thought it would be interesting to tell you a little bit about it. So we found that individual differences in frontal gamma power during rest highly correlated with concurrent language and cognitive abilities at all ages. Um, we also found that children with a family history of language learning impairment, remember these kids are at risk. Um, had lower frontal gamma power at all ages. And gamma power was also associated with attention measures. Children who were observed as having better inhibitory control and more mature attention shifting, being able to engage and disengage, had higher gamma power. Um, so we were like, whoa, that's really interesting. Um, and then we continued to follow this group of children in order to examine whether there was predictive power of looking at these levels in, um, across this uh, language burst. And uh, we found that examining gamma across the language burst strongly predicted to both cognition and language at ages four and five years. So at these ages, predicted to four and five years of age language, and specifically, we saw that resting gamma measured at 16, 24, and 36 months was associated with four-year PLS3 comprehension scores and self-P word structure and sentence scores. We also found that at both 24 and 36 months, gamma power was significantly associated with five-year sentence imitation and 36-month gamma power was also significantly associated with five-year syntactical skills. OK, so really, that's surprising. Um, we don't think that gamma, in general, is just a function of language. We believe that the capacity, or, or it's not tightly linked to language itself, we believe that the capacity to generate higher power in the gamma range at these crucial developmental periods where the child is having bursts 
may index better modulation, better modulation of attention and allow easier access to working memory, providing an advantage for overall development, particularly in the linguistic domain. Um, we also think that if we looked at other age periods, and we're starting to do that now, it may be linked to an emergent function, something that the child is acquiring. And that's why it was really good to look at this language burst, because kids were at all different points um, in acquiring their language. Um, and so those links may, if we looked at emergence of some other function, maybe even a motor function, um, we might be able to see that gamma was linked to that and predicted to some other function. Although motor develops is not a good one because motor sort of evens out and smooths out over time. Um, so I'm going to give you just a, a peek at some preliminary data in family history, uh, uh, negative and family, uh, children with a family history and their family history negative controls. Um, so this is under review. And um, we examine the, the temporal dynamics of brain activity that may support rapid auditory processing abilities in a subset of six-month-old infants at higher risk for language learning impairments and their um, controls. And we used, this is a lot, you don't really need to read all that, but we used uh, a passive oddball paradigm to complex tone pairs. We used co-registered age-appropriate MRIs, which we generated ourselves, so that we would have um, a good head model so that we can source localize. Um, because as I discussed earlier this afternoon, babies' brains are different in that they have less gray-white packing, less myelination, more cerebral spinal fluid, they have thinner scalps, thinner bones, and they have fontanelles. So signals that are traveling through the head uh, are very different um, at various ages, and so you really need to control for this. So we modeled a two-dipole uh, source solution for each individual, and then you can read the rest. We um, for space um, and with time resolution of 50 milliseconds, um, and changes in frequency band a a amplitude as a function of time relative to stimulus presentation was evaluated, and that's TSC, that's temporal spectral evolution. And it's a measure of um, um, amplitude and power that's linked to the stimulus that you're presenting. So you, you do this um, de, uh, devolving sort of um, paradigm where you pull apart internally generated um, um, uh, frequency uh, oscillations from those that are only um, initiated by the stimulus that you're looking at. And uh, Sylvia Ortiz Montilla, who I think is the first author on this, would know, it's Nassim Chowdhury, would shoot me for that explanation, but there we go. So what we found, interestingly, was significant group differences in theta power, the 5 to 8 hertz, between 300 and 550 milliseconds. So these, these control infants, the deviant stimulus, this is the pre-deviant standard. These are the controls, these are the risk kids, this is the left and this is the right. Um, and what you see is that they showed enhanced theta in left cortical regions when processing these rapid rate stimuli. These are still not language stimuli. These are language-like in their spectrotemporal parameters. Um, whereas family history positive infants showed um, attenuated activity in the left to right regions, showing this very atypical lateralization. And if you were looking at the slide I showed you five or six slides before, you can see that supporting what we were seeing in the ERP. So we're able to look a level below that at what's happening with oscillations and see that, yes, there are differences in how this is being engaged. And you all call there's a, um, that there's a longer latency here before it um, shows up. So the question is, if we can find some, some, and there's more, but I'm not going to tell you everything because it's under review. Uh, so the question is, if we can find such deficits so early in life, can we alter them using the exquisite plasticity typical of this early developmental period while infants are still setting up their acoustic mapping? Oh, so here's the, here's the, I forgot I put that in. 
<laughs> okay, so the question is, can we make the baby a better processor? Because we know that helps. We know it predicts, right? Um, can we support optimal sensory mapping in the brain? And can we see intervention-specific changes in brain waves, in ERPs, and in oscillatory patterns that reflect enhanced processing? And doing these sorts of experiments will also enable us to determine some causal links. So if you change something and then you see that the change is dependent on that, you can begin to talk about causality rather than just association. So we did a study. Um, we actually did a bunch of studies, but we did this one study looking at plasticity in developing brain. This was published in 2014, made a big splash in the press. Um, so I just told you earlier that infants are mapping their language representations over the first year as they tune into the native language environment. So they're paying more attention to native language and beginning to pay less attention to sounds that are not part of the surrounding language. Um, and I told you that construction of sensory maps has been widely studied, but only in animal models in general. A little bit in adults um, where you can do this mapping. Um, and it demonstrates that cortical representations of the sensory environment are continuously modified by experience. So um, there's, a, there's sort of a, an equilibrium that needs to be reached between plasticity and stability, right, as the child. Because if things were changing all the time, that wouldn't be good either, right? You wouldn't remember what I just said. What did I just say? Anyway. And the other thing is, uh, one critical time period, which we just discussed, for optimizing language mapping appears to be early in the first year. So, but there had not really been studies, there had not been any good studies in humans, there had not been studies in infants, and the influence of what's happening passively, like passive experience, as compared to active experience, are as yet incompletely understood. And there's a huge dialogue in the language domain, in the linguistics domain, about how babies actually learn language. I mean, is it that um, there are these um, pre-wired uh, aspects of language that are there in the brain and then elaborated? Uh, is it uh, experience dependent? We know that it's both, but we certainly don't know at which point you can just passively expose a child to something and have the brain change as compared to active experience. So we wanted to try to do that. So we investigated the neural correlates of acoustic mapping with Densere EEG ERP before and after a six-week interactive progressive acoustic experience with temporally modulated non-speech stimuli. And we used an operantly conditioned child-friendly go-no-go, we have an eye tracker, um, active paradigm with eye tracking, allowing the baby to move their eyes and, and to control the stimulus. And the controls included a passive, passive acoustic experience with the same stimuli, amount of exposure, um, but no control, a naive maturational control. So here's a little, these are the groups, active experience, passive, and naive controls, which are cross-sectional, and here's a little. So. Four months, we start them at four months, six weeks of active auditory training, then we saw them at seven, nine, um, 12, and 18 months. Passive, six weeks of passive training, seven, nine, uh, 12, and 18 months. And then for the naive groups, we used these groups first because they hadn't had any experience, and then a new cohort at seven months, a new cohort at nine months, a new cohort, so every time we had to get more babies more and more babies. We had to steal them from the supermarket. You know how parents leave them in the little carts? Well, you can just go and pick them up. <laughs> Nobody notices, at least till they get to the checkout. Of course, you get arrested doing that. <laughs> so the active group had interactive training. They came once a week for six weeks, and they interacted with the stimuli for six to eight minutes. They were trained on three different types of paired stimuli, complex tones, bandpass noise, and frequency sweeps. They were presented at varying interstimulus intervals and varying complexities, and we used an up-down staircase procedure. 
So if the baby got it right, it got harder. If the baby got it wrong, they got it again. If they got it wrong again, it got easier. Um, the passive group had the same stimuli, same time exposure, but passive with no feedback, no control. And the naive group didn't have any training. We were just looking at what was happening to their brains naturally. Because of course babies do this, right? This is what they're doing right then. And uh, the pretest, and so this kind of is a summary of what's happening. They hear a background, they hear a change, um, a multisensory reward pay to reinforce them. So it's operant conditioning. And then we have a brief time window in which we look for the baby's response using the eye tracker. So the pre- and post-test sessions included a go-no-go -no -go looking task designed to assess the infant's ability to learn an association between an auditory stimulus and the onset of a video reward. And successful learning of the contingency was demonstrated when the infant anticipated that the video display was going to come on. So um, when the sound changed and they looked in the time window to where the reward was going to show up, so operant conditioning. So afterwards, at seven months, we looked at uh, EEGs. We used complex tone pairs with either a 300 or 70 millisecond within pair interstimulus interval. Um, and we also used three types of generalization stimuli using a multi-deviant paradigm. So there's uh, uh, the deviants were designed with spectrotemporal parameters that significantly differed from the varying stimuli. So we used a gap, uh, a duration stimulus, and a frequency stimulus. And here, for the standard, it was an 800 hertz, simple, simple complex tone um, inter interspersed with three single deviant stimuli. So it was randomized. Sometimes they had five, sometimes they had seven, and then they would be deviant. So we had a single complex tone that differed in frequency, 800 versus 1200 hertz. These were all seven, 70 millisecond long um, uh, stimuli. Uh, we had a 30 millisecond complex tone as compared to 70, so that was duration. And then we had a very difficult stimulus that was a 70 millisecond complex tone with a 20 millisecond gap in it. Now babies should be able to do this. They can go down to eight to 10 milliseconds at about two to three months of age. So they should be able to do this, but it's a hard task, and a lot of adults can't do it. So don't panic. Um, I'm gonna walk you through this, and I'm gonna take you a look at segments. So what did we find? This shows grand average waveforms uh, by group for the active group, the passive group, and the naive controls uh, for this P2 peak and the N2 peak. And I'm gonna just kind of walk you through it. You can look at these time-locked um, appropriate topograms, um, and you can see um, this is to the P2 peak component, which we think is attentional, and um, sometimes you'll see it, this called P3, but we don't know if it's the same as in adults. And the red boxes around a topogram that significantly different from the other groups, and uh, you can see that just by looking at the latency. So these, these babies show this response at 312 milliseconds, these at 340, and this is 360 milliseconds. So the actives were faster than the passives, the passives were, active, uh, were faster than the naives. Um, and when we looked at this N2 star peak, which of course we know is really important, we saw something very interesting. Again, a red box indicates faster. In this case, the latencies were the same for the passive and the active. Very different um, from the naive controls. We also wanted to ascertain that these results were not attribu attributable to a specific and isolated practice effect. Um, so here we have generalization to the non-exposed stimuli the bar graphs depict the mean latency of each deviant at each of the nine electrode sites by group for the P1. The P1 is the first sensory peak that signals that a stimulus has been perceived. So each of these three, the gap, the duration, and the frequency is for each of these. This is F3 site. This is F3, yeah. 
So here's the active, the passive, and the naive controls. The actives are always red, the pa passives are always green, and the naive controls are always blue. And what you can see is that um, we had significantly faster, so these circles mean it's significantly faster, um, uh, significantly faster P1 latencies for all three deviants at all nine cluster sites. So it wasn't just over acoustic cortex. It was showing you these responses centrally, uh, frontally, um, and um, the significant differences were very striking. Now I just lost my cursor. Um, and then the other interesting thing is that if you look at the standard signal, now we talked about this this afternoon, the fact that the standard, that background sound is really important because the standard is really a surrogate for acoustic mapping. So what happens? A signal comes in over and over and over again, and you end up making um, a network, an acoustic map, that's responding to that configuration of sounds. So the standard is your acoustic, really represents your acoustic map. Um, and if you have a really good acoustic map, when your deviants come in, it's easy to tell whether they're the, the different or the same, right? So we had this discussion this afternoon. So the standard is really, imp really important because that's what allows you to make finer and finer discriminations if you have this really good um, acoustic map. So the interesting thing is the morphology for the standard waveform differed markedly between groups at every time point across the waveform. And I'm not going to show you that. But, I, but what I'd like you to see is that the P1 peak for the standard waveform right here, so this is peak latency and this is peak amplitude. You see that the, um, the uh, auditory, um, the active experience group, these are latencies, were sig significantly faster than the passives and the naives. Not true for the N1. But what we did see as well is that across maturation, what happens in the EEG is the, is the waveforms get faster, you get more complex waveforms, and you get smaller amplitude as the, as the processing gets more efficient. And so what you see here for the amplitude is that the active experience group actually showed a more mature configuration. Oh, that's interesting. Um, why is that on the slide? Why do you have that? Swipe three fingers? Ooh, wow. I don't really know what, I don't need to know what the NASDAQ is doing. <laughs> Even though my husband's a hedge fund manager, he probably sent that. <laughs> so the multi-deviate standard implies, these results imply, that active experience generates a more accessible um, representation and further suggests that interactive auditory experience um, induced um, experience-dependent changes in sensory memory, which is kind of what we wanted to see. And I'm going to just skip this. So, so we demonstrated that while both active and passive acoustic experience from four to seven months using temporally modulated non-speech stimuli impacted acoustic mapping, active experience conferred a significant advantage. But the passive also did something, right? So maybe we're right on the cusp where they need, the passive is helping, but it's not having as strong an effect as the active. We also showed that active experience increases attention to environmental acoustic stimuli. Um, that is larger and faster P2 peaks when compared to passive experience or maturation alone. And let me say, which I probably said before and I'll say again, this is what babies are doing. This is their job. We don't need to give them an intervention to get them to scan the environment to see what's out there that might be language, because that's what they're doing, right? What we're trying to do is to help them do it more efficiently. And the, these are all typically developing kids that I'm telling you about now. 
and we're now three quarters of the way through a sample of kids who are at higher risk. So you first have to see what you can do to a typically developing brain and see whether this sort of help um, makes a difference in how efficient their processing is. And as the example I was giving before, when we were talking in the this, in this symposium, is that if you're building a tower, if while you're building it, I tell you, don't put that block there, move it over here, or it's going to be unstable, that's really helpful. Whereas if you've already built it, and I say that block in the middle is a problem, in order to get to that block, you've got to take it down and then build it back up. So that's the advantage to working in this age period. Um, faster latencies were also seen for the change discrimination peak. You know, this is really, really exciting. This has been shown to be a robust infant predictor of later language. So we're changing that N2 star peak on the deviant wave. We haven't gotten out to four or five years yet. Most of the kids are just turning 12 and 18 months. Well, 18 months, we're collecting data. But we think that this is actually going to help um, fine tune that response. And sharpening is evident for both trained and untrained stimuli over and above that scene for maturation alone. So this is the test of whether you've changed something. If you just change one stimulus, you can give them practice with something, they can get better at that, but they need to be able to generalize. And they have done that. So interactive exposure to stimuli containing pre-linguistic, this is not language, pre-linguistic acoustic cues appears to support more efficient, more mature sensory processing, and further provides the opportunity to examine these very early precursors of language acquisition. Specifically, it appears to facilitate neural plasticity and more efficient sensory process, uh, processing during the um, developmental period when infants are actually constructing their sensory maps. And so the ability to fine tune acoustic mapping as it emerges could very well have far-reaching implications for prevention or amelioration of developmental language disorders. And that's why we're really excited about it. So all right, so here we go. Now, that was the end of that study. There's a lot more in it, but I'm not going to tell you all about it. The big question, does it generalize to language, right? So this is a paper that's now under review. Sylvia Ortiz Montilla is the, is the first author. So at the seven-month and nine-month post-intervention assessments, we explored response by group to computer-generated CV syllables with a voice onset contrast, a DA versus a TA, voiced versus unvoiced, followed by a 60 millisecond steady state vowel. And we used standard passive oddball, uh, 128 channel net. So this is, I'm just going to give you a few snippets of this. And what we saw was higher and earlier gamma activity. So these are the active, these are the passives, and these are the naive controls. And this is high gamma. This is a time frequency analysis from a source localization. Um, it starts at 80 hertz and goes up to 90 hertz. This is left auditory cortex. This is right auditory cortex in each of these cases. And higher and earlier, I'm going to just take that away for a minute, higher and earlier gamma activity above 70 hertz is a prominent characteristic of early processing of phonemes. Um, Stein Schneider, for example, showed in the posterior superior temporal gyrus um, that there were effects of phonemes. And it may index cortical activation, giving that larger high gamma but not low gamma responses, so in that 30 to 40 hertz range, um, correlate with increases in overall neuronal firing rates, particularly during attentional modulation. And this has been shown in animal models and in ECOG. And we can see it in babies because their heads are thinner, yes. Um, in humans, more consistent activations have been found in high gamma than in low gamma ranges within the auditory, visual, and also in the motor domains. Um, temporal spectral evolution um, and evoked changes in amplitude of oscillatory activity have been shown to be related to this high gamma. So what we saw here is in the active group, 
on both on the left and right auditory cortex, we see this high gamma, very strong response starting very early. You can see the passives are starting to develop a response on the left, a little bit on the right, but look how much later they are. And here you don't see this in the naive controls. They're still processing down here in early gamma. Um, and this is a little complicated, but let me see if I can do this. Um, what you can see is that, again, this is 80 to 90 hertz. And you can see the actives are, have this larger response as compared to the controls. Um, very early on, you see it comes on right away. Um, and that um, it's different both in left and in right auditory cortex. So you need to look at both. You can't just look at the big response. So I don't know whether this is very helpful, but it's there and it's very impressive. Um, and we also saw differences in intertrial phase locking. So intertrial phase locking measures variations in phase alignment at different frequency bands. And it indicates um, how evoked oscillatory activity, things that are evoked from the stimulus, in this case gamma, locks to stimulus presentation across trials. And this, um, uh, we don't have a, a circle here, and you can see here that there's a significant difference at nine months in early high gamma only in the active group, two CVs. So this is telling us that um, the locking to the stimulus presentation is much better in this active group. And so they're processing these phonemes in a much more efficient way. And they haven't had language. So I'm not going to show you that because I want to go on. So effects of early acoustic experience with non-speech stimuli generalized to speech and conferred a left hemisphere advantage for processing of a syllabic contrast varying in voice onset time. They, they not only supported faster speech processing in the left hemisphere, but accelerate the maturational trajectory. And we talked a lot about whether that's good or not good. We can discuss that a little bit more, particularly when the acoustic experience involved interactive training. But the passives also showed an effect. It just wasn't as big. And acoustic experience appears to facilitate syllable representation over an important period when infants are establishing their phonetic maps. Okay, so, given the many studies using animal models that show continuous modification of developing cortical representations by the sensory environment, remember we talked about this at the beginning, these changes make powerful sound exposure-based plasticity typical of critical early developmental period. And they, these findings provide evidence for the critical role of non-linguistic auditory processes in early language development and further our understanding of the precursors of language development and impairment. So I'm going to just go past this because this is obvious. So let me talk a little bit about in the last five minutes or so about our translation to real world. Um, and we've developed, uh, we've done technology transfer and try to take what we didn't do in the lab and translate it to an environment that could be in the home, in the doctor's office, um, in the clinic. Um, and uh, so this is the wrapped Abby. Wait, let me go back. He's moving very fast. I think it's a, it's a, it's a unisex. Even though it's called Abby, it could be AB, right? So what you see here is uh, we had a design and an uh, engineering team, and we made a lovely little robot. Actually, this one's better, right? It's not so confusing. Oh, this has the picture on it. So the camera which tracks the baby's eyes is located here. You can see the infrared markers here. I can see it better on my screen. And this, it, and this contains the hardware and the software that manages the auditory and visual input of the prototype. On the infant's right, is this LED attentional screen. And you see the lights. There will be lights coming on. I'll show you that in a moment. Um, and um, so this is, the re and this is the reward screen where we train the baby to look for a pop-up video, a 1.5 um, second video. Um, and these are in the form of eyes on the top of the main bubble. And uh, here's a baby sitting in front of it. You can see it's, it says it's booting 
but it isn't because that was just a flaw. So this is our pre-prototype um, attention fixation screen. And you can see that even older children are very engaged. This baby, this child, a 12-month-old, is looking at the attention fixation screen, the smaller screen. And then after, after when the video comes on, she's just very engaged. And even though we had to hold her so she wouldn't try to grab um, this obviously not child <laughs> prototype, um, the baby was very, very engaged. Um, and I'm going to show you a little bit of a video um, that shows how, uh, this is a 3.5 month old interacting with the wrapped Abby. Um, and let me see if this will work. So you can see the. And you could see the baby looking back and forth between the screens. And on the top of that, um, you can see, I don't know whether you can see that up here, there are two little lights right on the top of the head between the eyes. And you need to put the baby in front of it, and it captures the eyes and the green lights come on. It's real, it's fabulous. I mean, the baby looks away and they look back and it's state-of-the-art eye tracking. It only needs one eye. So let me go past. We also have control software that lets us follow the eye gaze. And this is a video, but I'm not going to turn it on. Can you see the red in there? So you can see the eye, eye gaze trail and it's collecting data. It holds the data. It can upload it either to the cloud, it can upload it to a computer. Um, it saves the gaze pattern and fixation data and forwards it to an, a database or organizes it for parental feedback. And we're also able to link using Bluetooth um, to a PC or a phone app uh, and convey into information about the level achieved and improvements over time or to collect data on a series of infants that are using this. Um, and of course, the baby wants to see how they're doing as well because they're really very motivated to do well at this age. I think this is a, <laughs> a seven-month-old. Um, so I've shown you a little bit about what we're doing. Let's talk a little bit about the relevance um, to educational neuroscience, because we really kind of want to make the links between the type of neuroscience that I'm doing and the type of neuroscience you're doing. And it's the same, right? Basically. We're using converging state-of-the-art brain and behavior studies to delineate developmental trajectories for abilities central to early child development, including language acquisition, pre-reading, and cognitive development, all critical to later social and academic success. I have to stop doing that. That's really bad. Very Trumpian. Our research to date suggests that measures of rapid auditory processing can serve as a marker of developmental learning disorders. And we have, a, we have a biomarker because we can actually see the differences in the oscillatory patterns. So it supports this non-invasive identification of infants at higher risk of developmental language disorder and hopefully provides early remediation of these disorders. We're hoping that if you reorganize these acoustic maps very early on in development, Maybe they won't have the disorder. Maybe you can do it way even before they begin to talk. Maybe it'll ameliorate it. We don't know what's going to happen, but we're following these infants. Um, and tracking the emergence of dynamic coordination and its role in organizing lower level sensory processing and how such mechanisms impact language and cognition will permit a deeper understanding of the organization and course of early brain maturation. We still have so much to learn about what's going on over this time period. And this will enable earlier identification and treatment of divergent patterns in groups at highest risk. So if you see a particular pattern, and they're already doing this in the area of autism, maybe you do early intervention because it won't hurt them, right? And we're actually thinking of this um, because we found that this sort of intervention worked really well in typically developing children. Um, why not? 
give them an opportunity to sharpen their skills at that early age. We think parents would like that. So we're, we're actually trying to get a company going that would do, um, uh, provide a commercial model of this and then secondarily to provide it to clinics and daycare centers and you know maybe with a, uh, a non-for-profit arm. So we're still working it out. It's very hard doing technology transfer. I already have, I have nine patents so far for this. So, and as I was saying this afternoon, I have one for China. So we'll see how that goes. But <laughs> I have it in Europe and, um, and in um, Hong Kong. And so one more thing, examining the role of early plasticity, attention and sensory recruitment in the construction of cortical sensory maps provides an essential, essential bridge to understanding later development. And these techniques that I've been talking about, particularly in translation and the sort of things that Laura Ann Petito are doing, allow the possibility of remediating developmental language disorders well before babies speak their first word and thus could have far-reaching implications for education and for society at large. And that's what educational neuroscience is about, making those links from the research that's being done in the lab to the greater good of society and we're going to try to do that. So with that, thank you. And thank you to my research team who are all brilliant and wonderful. And here's my group of collaborators, not a trivial group. And finally, let me thank our funders, because without their money, we wouldn't have been able to do all these very expensive longitudinal studies. And thank you for listening. Now we're going to have some questions, then afterwards I will hand out the usual evaluation sheet and, um, uh, to everyone, so please fill that out and give it back to me. And after when we're done um, asking all the questions and finishing to make sure that you're really tired for the end of the day, we can all go for the reception in the atrium in SLCC and everybody's welcome to join. So I'm going to get a grade? Oh no. no. We are getting a grade. <laughs> I'm sure you have hundreds of questions. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. You're um, welcome. I agree with Ilaria. It was really, really, really great presentation. So Pat Cool, I thought it was interesting you're suggesting that his work with babies in front of TVs, um, if you find an impact or not, and no, um, the, the passive learning language, um, or a passive learning language doesn't work. It needs to be interactive based, it needs to be acquired that way. Um, your study really brought that into, uh, brought that really up close, the, the mechanisms behind that. Um, I think that was very, very um, great. One question that came up in my mind, I wonder if, if the mechanism is reflected in the gamma peaks, if it's, if the active group, the passive group, and the control group um, do you think the mechanism would be um, apl readily applied to other modalities? Um, yeah, another way I could question. phrase. So suppose um, you know we're training um, and we're we're working with uh, the auditory function, and uh, suppose the child has two language um, functions, both sign language and um, spoken English. Given uh, the training in the spoken modality or the auditory modality. Would we expect to see that also applied to some type of language-based development in sign language as well? 
Okay, that's a very long and very involved question, but I like it. Uh, one comment first. Pat Cool, as wonderful as she is, is wrong about children not learning passively from screens. Um, they do learn. Obviously, lots of, you must know lots of kids who've learned uh, English from um, Sesame Street or whatever. Um, yes, it's much better to have active engagement, but that doesn't mean that children can't learn um, from passive environments. But of course, we, you will notice in our, um, in our prototype, our little robot, that uh, we don't have big screens in front of the babies. And that is one, one of the reasons is, is that screens are very discouraged for children of that age. Um, and we wanted the shortest amount of screen time possible because parents were very sensitive to that. But as to your cross-modality question, um, I don't think it's just gamma. I actually was going to put up one of these. Um, we actually, do I have a theta gamma? I actually have a slide that shows that we change gamma um, and um, theta interaction um, after intervention. So it's not just gamma, it's both gamma and theta. Um, I think from what I know, and you have to remember that, uh, that's, that I'm not an expert in um, uh, visual language, but from what I've read, it seems that the same brain areas are used. Um, and now sensory maps need to be constructed in very much the same way. Um, so I do believe that the mechanism may be very similar. And if, if you think about, um, see, there are differences in sensory modalities that are just wiring up basic abilities like, um, like um, ocular dominance columns. That just kind of happens. But when it's, and that's experience dependent, right? So it's, it, it, it's done with input from the environment, but it begins even before that being sorted. Um, with the language, um, we don't know how much, how much is in there as far as um, what's already ready to, what, what's already um, prepared for input. We know that, in fact, that that is the case because babies do the statistical learning and I suspect they do it in the, I'm just looking at Laura Ann for feedback here, um, that uh, I'm pretty sure they do it in, this, in the, uh, uh, the visual language domain as well. But I would not be surprised if the mechanism is the same, just because the brain tends to do things in a way that works well um, across modalities. Um, so I think that you might be able to shape. See, now, I don't know whether this happens. It's a little hard for me to answer this question because I don't really know enough about the development of babies that are, that are learning sign. But it seems to me from the work that I've read, mostly yours, Laura Ann, that babies begin to do like this nonsense babbling, and then they, they gradually start to make these sort of unformed handshakes and that that's modulated by input from their environment. So how do they figure out how to make that distinction? Um, uh, I was looking at your alphabet, your, your sign alphabet in your lab. How do they learn the difference between this and this, or this and this? You know, yeah, help me. Yeah, so that's a very small difference. And it must be that the sensory mapping is being perfected first in a very rough kind of coarse kind of way so that each of those signs has a different pool of neurons that are responding to it and that they gradually get more refined. And has anyone done this work? Yeah, so that you can do it in a more automatic way because otherwise you wouldn't be able to sign in real time like this. You would have to be you know, doing one sign and waiting for, for them to respond to you. So in both, in both um, oral and, and visual language, you really need to prepare this 
it's, it's mainly pre-linguistic. It's probably hand shapes to start with and then the relationship with, um, with uh, meaning. And in the, in the, order, in the, in the auditory system in, in, in oral language, it's very much the same thing. They hear these different sounds. They do duplicative babbling. And they're hearing these sounds. And they're encouraged to make specific other types of sounds, like mm, don't say da, say mm, say mama, for heaven's sakes, because I'm doing all this work. And why should you say dada first? So um, I'm thinking that that's probably the case. And I think that defining that um, mechanism, and we're trying very hard to do that. We're looking at cross-frequency phase coupling. See, it's not just hot gamma that changes. I don't know whether this is the right slide. But you also see differences in, in theta and differences in theta gamma coupling as the child becomes more expert. And so you're seeing a, something that's becoming more automatized but that actually is enabling the system to respond more quickly and not to pay so much attention to it so they can focus on the other things that they need to do, like figuring out what you're saying and thinking conceptually, uh, kind of like driving your car. You know, every time you got in the car, you'd have to think about, I have to put on the brake, I have to do this, I have to do that, I have to look in the mirror, you know, I have to check that there's no cars coming. That's a lot of stuff. But a lot of what you do as time goes on is automatized, like in language. But it allows you to do other things, like maybe listen to the radio and eat a Big Mac or whatever. So um, I think you're right. And I think it would be really, if we were able to uh, find converging mechanisms that look very much the same in um, early sign, children that are immersed in, a, but in a normal, not a deprived sign language background, you know, as we were just talking about earlier, you want someone, a child that is as enriched in the sign language domain as children are in the oral language domain. And you may be able to see the same developmental trajectory. Um, is that helpful? Yeah, no, it, it was very helpful. Um, I would agree with, um, with your thoughts. Um, and you said, you know, within the visual modality, um, you know, how, how they're processing and acquiring um, the phonemes, um, the categorization of the phonemes, what's in, what's out, um, and through time and through maturation, through the timeline. Um, and I agree with all of that, and I was very happy to, to, to hear that. Within, um, you know, this particular modality, that particular modality, now I guess I'm wondering, is it because they're developing a more finely tuned auditory map or uh, acoustic map, I should say, um, for those particular sounds. Um, and that is what's helping to proceed along that pathway, or is it because um, the process of developing the fine tuned maps, if, if, if whether that's supporting the mechanism and that mechanism itself, um, if it's indexed, you know, like you said, by the theta and the gamma correlations, is that, okay, so if that's the mechanism, okay, and I'm learning how to, um, or I'm having more experience with the auditory um, pathways, and I switch to another modality, if I'm going to basically try to um, maybe, maybe, maybe look at a tactile sense, for example, like, uh, um, If yeah. I'm just making motions on a hand, will they respond to that? I guess that's my, that's my question. Well, you know, it's a, it's a really good question. And it's, um, just think a little bit. You know, like when I, when I just talked about the, 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 well, when I talked about gamma power and the fact that um, when we looked at, um, it prospectively, when we when we looked at the predictive response, we could see things like relationships to sentence structure. So, does that mean that gamma is specifically related to sentence structure? No. It just means that the brain is learning to organize information and move it around in a way that supports that particular ability. 
And I think this is kind of the same thing that you're talking about. I'm talking about fine-tuning acoustic maps because that helps handle the information that's coming in in a better way. So if you fine-tune that map so you don't have to spend a lot of time using context and repetition to pull things apart and figure out what it was that came in, um, that's good because that makes it easier for you to set up the mechanisms that capture that information and relate it to other information in the brain. So I think, which I think that, that would be true if you were learning Braille. I think that would be true if you were learning sign language. So what you're trying to do, I think what we're trying to do here is make the best input that we can. Um, and as I talked to someone today, I said, you know, it may be the case that in some children, this is not going to help, even though we saw this bump up in all the typically developing kids. We're just beginning to look at the data from the kids that have a family history, because maybe in some children, the mechanism for um, resolving this kind of information is so broken that this behavioral intervention won't work. I mean, we don't know that. Maybe, maybe it will. I mean, I don't know. But the point is that if you can clean the input enough and make it so that you have this fast, efficient processing, then you have a better chance of getting those mechanisms set up appropriately that will take that information and connect it with other brain areas. So look at you know, uh, where you have, um, you know, syntactic information and grammatical information. And if you hear the sound, if you, if you perceive um, a particular word like apple, just think about it. If you think of apple, just in a, in a fraction of a second, you pull all of this information together, what it smells like, what it looks like, what color it is, apples in your yard, apple pies, grandma, whatever. How does that happen? That happens because the brain is able to communicate on these various scales. And it's able to access information both locally and globally. And the way that happens is through dynamic coordination, through oscillations. And I'm not saying that what we're doing, what we're doing is changing dynamic coordination. Um, but I don't know if it's changing it in the same way and in an adequate way to make sure that none of these kids are going to have problems. And I think that's the same issue that you have in sign, the same issue you have in Braille, connecting the input information with the information that you already have stored or that you are in the process of storing in these developing children. So I don't know whether that answers your question, but that's the closest I can come. Um, and, I, and I would not be surprised if those mechanisms, after you've resolved that information, I would not be surprised if they're very similar. We're also studying, <clears throat> we're also studying traveling waves. Thank you. Which may resolve, we hope at some point when we resolve some of these issues about how that information is handled. Terry Sinowski and Lyle Muller and Sue Peters, my postdoc and I, are looking at traveling waves. So instead of just looking at oscillations, we're looking at waves that sweep in various directions around the brain. We don't know. We see these in adults. You can see them in monkeys. We're sure they're in babies. Nobody's been able to look at them. You have to use a very uh, sophisticated statistical technique to be able to look at them. So we have a grant from um, the Cobley Foundation. And I think I forgot to put those on, put that on my funders, but to look at that. Um, and so what you really want to figure out is how the brain is handling information, what it does with it, and, and what's the mechanism by which, I mean, we still don't really know. We can identify the, the wires and the way information is conveyed. You can say, oh, you know, it's going up the arcuate fasciculus, and it's going here, and it's going there. But we don't really know how those communications are done. We have the very lower level stuff, and we have sort of medium level. But that connecting part where the communication happens. We're just beginning to learn a little bit about that. So that's the best I can do because there's a lot. <laughs> um, I have a question, but if someone else wants to ask a question, I can keep mine for later. I have a short one, yes. Um, 
I'm going to turn my computer off because it's tired. So before you mentioned that you were doing your assessment. Could on you talk a little bit more loudly? Yes. Thank you. So you mentioned that when you started your assessment of um, children or infants that were acquiring other languages, like you said, um, Italian and Spanish, um, did you see a difference in the type of stimulus a attention? Like, for example, was it uh, for the syllable based? Um, were, were they stressed for time? Did you see a, a difference in the a temporal or stress based? Okay. Okay, well, all of the data are not in yet for the Spanish group, um, but we're looking at the same stimuli, and in the, in the Italian group, we're not looking at language. We're only looking at tone sequences, um, uh, uh, differences in frequency and differences in duration, with the Italian group having, like the duration stimulus we have that it had that was 70 and 30, they have, actually have 70, and then they have 90. 90. So that's, that's hard, hard to hear the difference between, the, to, to, to hear the difference between those two. Um, and as far as language specific, we know that babies can discriminate these, I mean, they can, they can use the prosody of the language. I mean, this is work that Angela Federici and and people in her group have done that show that two and three month olds can already tell the difference between a stream of German and, and, and English and, uh, and prefer to turn to the German just because the whole prosody of the signal is different. And it's true in Italian as well, and it's true in Spanish. So we're trying to look at the more fine-grained ability to discriminate those, and what we can see like if I'll send you some of Sylvia's, Ortiz Montilla's papers, is that as phonemic um, uh, narrowing occurs, the babies, first of all, in the beginning, they treat the Sp a Spanish um, ta and, a, and an English ta as the same. And the, the Spanish, I can hear the difference now, but I can't produce it. Um, and they treat them the same. Um, they start to show some preferential for the native language for English, because these are English monolinguals, um, at six months, which is much earlier than anyone suggested that they're beginning to do this. But if you look at them behaviorally, they treat them the same. But if you look at their brain and what the brain is doing, the brain is beginning to lean toward the English ta. Um, and by the time they get to 12 months, they have a much less, much less of a response to the, to the uh, Spanish ta. Um, so, the, so the brain is distinguishing what it's hearing. So what about kids that are bilingual that are hearing both? One would think that those would not drop out and you would have a bigger phoneme space. Um, but we haven't done those experiments. Um, Pat Cool's done these really nice magnet studies that really show that there are these categorical spaces and some languages have a lot, like Swedish, and some have very few, like Japanese. Um, and if that phoneme space is closed in very early on, it's a lot harder to expand it than if you, and I think some of the effects that you see in bilinguals, where they seem to do better at manipulating um, uh, various conceptual concepts, they tend to stay better longer uh, memory-wise, has to do with the fact that they've actually kept a more open phoneme space. And we're actually hoping if we do this sort of pre-linguistic training with babies, we're hoping that that may keep their phoneme space open longer. So even if they're not hearing another language, I mean, I wouldn't say that's not for public consumption, but that's what we think. Well, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Uh, it's really fascinating work. Thank you. Thank you. If you if you ask me, I will send you those phonemic narrowing papers. Yes, great. Thank you. Oh my God, balloons. How exciting. And more weight for you. Since you were complaining that you already had a heavy spot. I wasn't complaining. I was just saying that it was heavy. Well, then we want to make sure the other arm gets worked, <laughs> right? So thank, thank you, you much. so it's much. It's a pleasure to have you here. That's very exciting. It says thanks. Am I allowed to look? Whatever. No. Um, I will be distributing the 
for it. And then everybody, please join us at, uh, the, to the reception in SLCC. Thank you. And, I'm, uh, I'm going to tie these to my wrist. Yes. You know how they do with little kids? They tie them to their wrists so they don't lose them. <laughs> Thank you all for listening. <laughs>